All right, our next speaker is Chris Ivey, who is working on his PhD at Stanford University in computational fluid dynamics. His advisor is Professor Parviz Moeen, and he completed his practicum at Argonne National Labs in 2012. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, so let me apologize beforehand. Uh, so I do most of my work in numerical methods, and it's not holistic, and I can't say a lot about like science as a whole or anything. Um, one thing I can say, though, is you pretty much only need your like, middle school math to understand the numerical methods, so at least they're visual and pretty. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is basically how I was able to get this pretty jet to go across the screen using a technique called the volume of fluid method and using geometry in order to make it stable and pretty. So uh, to motivate this, because someone had to want me to work on this, uh, we have um, part of a, a turbofan engine, and this was done part of the old ASCII program uh, where we had a couple of different type of simulations that were done. Um, this was like a RANS, which is like a steady state thing with some low order models. And then for combustion, we had some turbulent flow modeling that we did, and then back to some sort of lower order model. And basically the whole point was to be able to get this sort of information you can propagate it through to get some sort of information about thrust in the design as a whole. Well, part I'm interested in is one of these little sectors right here, which is of course really important to this whole thing, obviously, is that we have an injection of fuel. This fuel will break apart and it'll be lit on fire. So what we, the top of the line simulations these days, pretty much you inject a sphere and then you just let the sphere break up using some sort of random stochastic model and maybe a little bit of heuristics. And this um, will turn into a gas and then allow you to create a flame. Uh, so obviously saying that the fluid that you inject is a sphere and you just let it go is not necessarily the truth. And it's been shown that this spray and its distribution um, actually dictates this flame. So I'm interested in finding the instabilities that break up and form this spray before it evaporates. All right. So, uh, Probably the only equations I'll actually show, because like I said, I'm, I like geometry. Uh, so we have the Navier-Stokes equations in the middle. Uh, to the left, we have a transport of momentum. We have forcing from pressure, you know, push me, I push you. And then we have spreading due to viscosity. And then we have this other term, surface tension. Basically, it's what holds spheres together, um, like water droplets. Uh, and the way we model this is we have a marker function. Basically, am I a liquid or am I a gas? And then we want to evect this marker function. So in order to have a stable method and one that's accurate, we uh, need to make sure that this operator is bounded and conservative and, of course, accurate. And I don't know how much you know about evection, but that, that's really hard to do. I mean, you put like a Gaussian wave through an evection operator and it becomes like a sinusoidal growing thing, and that's just not allowed. You can't have negative mass. Uh, the other thing is we have a direct delta here. Um, so we have a forcing term only at a, an interface. So we need to calculate the normal to an interface, and we also need to get the curvature local to the interface. And this uh, is hard, because like I said, it's discontinuous. So I'm going to use geometry in order to try to accommodate these two operators to create a, a part of a stable solver. Oh, and I should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, this guy is complicated. Um, so I can't do Cartesian meshes. And that really makes my life difficult and makes all these problems even more apparent. So from Cartesian meshes, there was this method called height functions. Pretty much, you parameterize a surface. And then from this parameterization, you're able to differentiate it. Uh, what you can do on Cartesian grids from like the mean value theorem is if you have the marker function integrated over a cell, and then you sum up all the volume fractions along a column, and this column is somewhat aligned to the direction of the normal to the interface, you actually get the height. Um, and this, like a discrete height. And just like you differentiate the parametric surface, you can just use, you know, central derivatives to get the normal, you know, this guy minus that guy to get the normal in this direction. And then for curvature, it's just basically the second derivative. Um, and these are just simple finite difference operators. And these have been shown to give you second order estimates, stuff that converges, which is nice. Uh, and the only thing you have to make sure of is that you have an OK estimate of the normal, so you know which direction to integrate across. And also you need to make sure that your um, 
that you only cross one interface. Uh, so like if you have multiple interfaces, you don't want to like have a zero volume fraction as you go down. So you just make sure it's monotonic. So in order to use this um, in an unstructured mesh, uh, so right here we have a bunch of triangles glued together. And we have properties at the node of each triangle. And then each node has a corresponding non-convex polygon. And this polygon is owned by that node. And that's where the property is stored. So what we uh, want to do is take advantage of that method from before. And what we would do is we'd find the bounding box of that non-convex polygon. And then we would create a stencil. And the way this would work is you would uh, basically just find a local mapping using like an ADT tree at the beginning of a simulation and then find which nodes contribute to this bounding box. Uh, and so for an example computation would be like you get all the volume fraction in this box and then you would sum it up on each of these columns and then you know differentiate between the left and right one to get it. The reason why it's uh, a cross is because the normal could have pointed in the other direction. So you might you know, possibly could need that one and we're trying to build the mappings at the beginning. All right, so the way this actually works is you have an estimate of the normal. Uh, you can use a simple gradient of the volume fraction field. And you have this volume fraction field um, on, the, on the mesh. You enforce it by fitting a plane. You say, OK, well, I'm going to use a low order topology to represent my surface, a bunch of discontinuous planes. And you fit these planes such that the volumes are matched. And then for each box of that stencil I showed you, you find where it intersects. And then you populate a new volume fraction. And then you do the computation of summing it up and differentiating. Uh, what you get out of this is an estimate of the normal and the curvature. And you can repeat this process um, to get a convergent result. Um, I found that it required two iterations to have some nice monotonic errors. Because this is an interpolation that uses the normal. And if you have a second order estimate of the normal, I can say this interpolation is second order. But that's only in the infinite sense. Uh, so I'm showing error plots, which are boring. But I just want to show that it does converge for the normal. Uh, one thing that is interesting, though, is that for the curvature, it eventually saturates at the higher precisions. And this is actually the same thing that would happen to you if you try to differentiate a signal with round off error. Eventually, you get this amplification factor, and it's a 1 over delta x squared. So eventually, you get a zeroth order error. And I just thought it was interesting that it showed up because now, instead of it being round off, it's the interpolation itself. So it comes up macroscopically. However, it is a monotonically decreasing thing, so it's a convergent method. So OK, now we have a method of getting the terms necessary to get forcing to put, keep my drop together. Now let's find a way to move the drop. Like I said before, we have discontinuous planes representing the interface. Uh, what we can do um, is try to use, to try to use those planes and then to find a region of do, so I can uh, find a region that intersects with it and donate it, use your polyhedron like library to integrate it exactly. So what you need is that you have a phase velocity um, and you extrude it back such that the volume of the total um, flux polyhedron matches the flux volume. And in order for this to be bounded and conservative, pretty much you need to prevent any of these um, polyhedra from overlapping. So your first one's free to become whatever it wants. It goes into the cell, intersects with the plane. You donate the red to the right cell. The blue one actually has more room than the cell itself. You, since this region and red was donated to him, he can now flux that region to the bottom cell. Um, conversely, for this one, the green one, since the red donated part of this volume to the right, the green region can't donate it to the left. So you basically incrementally enforce um, conservation. And these are lower order errors. However, their actual magnitude is really small. And you will find that like the accuracy, it doesn't change the second order accuracy of it in general. Uh, one issue I wanted to bring up is that, so we have a, so I'm doing a bunch of kinematic test cases just to like show you that it, it works. Uh, so you want to rotate this uh, disk and get back what you got. And what you have is a hex and a triangular mesh. What you end up seeing are these weird little um, artifacts but, and a lower order convergence. And this is just because this is a discontinuous function and you can't represent an interface that with this continuity with a height function like I did before. A nicer function is this smooth sphere where I sinusoidally um, just like deform it, twist it up, and then bring it back. And I look at the, um, the uh, try, I try to get back a circle, which I started with. Um, what happens is when you're under-resolved, you end up losing a little bit of mass, which you can't really see. 
Uh, however, you get good convergence. Uh, this is obvious, easier to see in 3D. We're on this like tetrahedral mesh. You're not able to sustain the interface, so you end up getting these holes, and these holes equal a little bit of mass. However, we do get convergence, and this is kind of difficult on, on structured meshes. Um, so uh, what I want to show you is actual data and uh, some physics. Uh, so I have to say some things about the rest of the solver. There were some issues, and these aren't pretty geometrical things. Uh, so basically, in order to have a, a scheme that's stable, uh, so we advect this marker function. Basically, you need to advect the momentum the same way. Um, basically, if you are very heavy, you want to make sure you're advecting, you're moving yourself and not someone else. It just won't, uh, it'll just end up creating the instability. Another thing is, say you have a sphere and you just borrow a drop and you put it in air, you want that drop to not move. Um, ironically, if you don't, if you just do that in these numerical simulations, it'll oscillate and blow up because of the density. Uh, last part is uh, traditionally these methods involve you solve part of the equation once, like the Navier Stokes equations, and then you enforce the fact that you want the velocity to be divergence free in the next step. And we use the same policy here. Uh, it's just more complicated because it's not a constant coefficient system. But that's that. Uh, like I said before, um, we want to place a sphere in a gas, a uh, liquid sphere with um, a liquid sphere without any velocity, and we would like the velocity field to not grow. Um, and basically, the way that it's discretized is your errors and curvature come out as errors in velocity. So we end up having these, um, this sphere that'll actually oscillate in front of you. And you can see that there is some sort of convergence, and this convergence approximately follows that of the curvature. However, at least it does converge, so we know that we will um, be able to suppress them. Uh, so earlier I said I'm interested in injection systems. We want to look at the instabilities that form that form the spray. Um, so and we're not going to look at the one we showed earlier. Um, however, this one is equally important. This is for your diesel engine in a car. Um, this is a single nozzle injector. And the nozzle shown here is created from an X-ray tomography map that was converted to an STL file, which was then converted to a mesh. And it's resolved very finely inside here in order to capture the turbulent structures. Um, we use large eddy simulation to model them, and it's well resolved. And you end up getting these like vertical structures near the wall, these hairpin vortices. And both the actual geometry and the formation of turbulence lead to a different type of atomization paradigm, which eventually leads to a different spray distribution, which dictates where your flames will occur when you combust it. So a uh, zoomed in picture of this uh, here. In a classical thing, you would see an azimuthal wave, which is basically like a radial sinusoid. And here we end up just getting a bunch of weird perturbations. And these perturbations lead to this, these growing, this growing cone angle and then an ensuing spray. Um, and so we wanted to find these. So we were interested in uh, finding the spray distribution downstream so that we can throw that into our other simulation where you can blow them up and actually have a lit gas. Um, we actually had a corroborating experiment from the Army Research Lab. However, the only thing they were able to look at was the cone angle. And the way they were measuring cone angle was using the actual draw or the actual fluid and we were using momentum and we also have some theory and we have some comparison for preliminary results but um, we're still doing more comparisons later on uh, but what we're actually interested in is the distribution of drops and the sizes that ensue um, and this is very very different um, than what you would get if say this was a simple instability and we are interested in feeding this distribution into the next solver, which would be part of the combustion system. Um, so my concluding remarks on this is that solving these two-phase systems is hard. And when the density ratio is large, which it is for fuel combustion, it's, it's just really, really bad. And unstructured meshes really, really are painful. Um, you don't have any nice properties you can take advantage of. So in order to get around this, I tried using this lower order topology representation of the interface and a non-convex polyhedral library to, divine, to create like discrete advection operators that, that are, are geometric advection operators that are discretely bounded, conservative, and accurate, and a convergent method to get the normals and the curvatures to get good forcing on it. Um, and with that, I am done. I'd just like to thank my colleagues at Stanford, uh, the DOE, for letting me work on this project.
Um, also, the Stanford Graduate Fellowship, which will be paying for me next uh, fall. With that, I'll take any questions. Oh, I'll take any questions. <laughs>